Good evening and welcome to Midnight Movie Club and my review of Halloween 2018. So this year's Halloween was directed by David Gordon Green who also co-wrote the script alongside Danny McBride. The film sees Jamie Lee Curtis reprise her role as Laurie Strode and Nick Castle as the iconic psycho slasher Michael Myers. But for the most part he was played by James Jude Courtney. Alongside them, the cast includes Judy Greer, Andy Matichek, and Will Patton. So what's this Halloween all about then? Well, Laurie Strode comes to a final confrontation with Michael Myers, the masked figure who has haunted her since she narrowly escaped his killing spree on Halloween night four decades ago. This Halloween disregarded all the sequels that came after the 1978 original, so forget all of those, all you have to watch to know what is going on here is the original. But there is that much exposition, you don't even have to watch the original if you haven't already. But in all seriousness, if you haven't already, come on, get a grip, go watch it. So we were told to forget all the NAF campy sequels for this, and here we get another NAF campy sequel. Now before I get into the nitty gritty of this review, this is how it's going to go. I am going to give the film an honest fair review like I do all films, then present my score. Then once my score has been presented, I am going to go into a spoiler discussion, but I will make sure there is fair warning for those of you who don't want to go into spoilers. But for me to get across how much this film frustrated me in certain places, I feel I need to touch on some spoilers. Now let's get into it. So straight off the bat, let's jump into the score. The iconic original score composed by John Carpenter has haunted us for generations. It is one of the best horror scores ever composed in my opinion, alongside the likes of The Exorcist, The Thing and The Shining. In Halloween 2018, Carpenter returns, this time with his son Cody Carpenter and Daniel Davies, with an amped up modernised version of the original. It is far more bassy and seasoned with extra synthy notes and drones to get you head banging in the cinema. So once again with the help from his son and Davies, Carpenter kills it with this score. Easily one of my favourite parts of this film. The score kicks in straight away with the opening credits. I loved how they put credits near the start, giving it that retro 70s vibe, and I loved the little touch to open up the film. But now on to how the film was shot, and this being David Gordon Green's first horror, in certain places it does show. Now don't get me wrong, there is some great shots in this, like the long single take tracking shot of Michael when he first returns to Haddonfield, that was a sight to see and was brilliant. But after that, there is just nothing too spectacular here to see. The cinematography in areas just fell a little flat in places even though it was competent throughout. We get none of those long suburban wide shots that give us the sense that our protagonists were being stalked and when the film was leading up to Michael popping out of the shadows to attack, it's like they didn't even know when to do it. They dragged out certain scenes that were inevitably leading to a mediocre jump scare. With no tension being created, these scenes just fell flat on their face. There was nothing new here. I felt no sense of isolation and vulnerability for any of our characters like I did in the original. But now let's move on to acting and the characters themselves. Jamie Lee Curtis is back as Laurie Strode who is now a doomsday prepper of sorts, living in a fortress of a house that has been laid out with booby traps. I feel if you have seen the trailer, then you have seen Curtis's best bits. To be perfectly honest, her character just annoyed me in the film. She felt more like an Ellen Ripley or a Sarah Connor here instead of a Laurie Strode and if that's what they were aiming for then they succeeded but it didn't feel right to me personally. Now I know that she's to be the film's strong female lead and by the end of the original Halloween she becomes one. I would just like to have seen that strength in this film presented in a different way instead of her becoming estranged from her family and living in constant fear. I really did feel that Curtis's character almost took a back seat most of the time to the other far more uninteresting characters, which was a shame. I wanted more of her in this and her character just wasn't done justice in my opinion. 
The supporting characters we have, Judy Greer, who plays Laurie's daughter, and Andy Matichek, who plays her granddaughter, they do a good job. They do their parts well. They are well acted, but their characters are ultimately useless. Matichek's character is only here to offer us a few more kills for the movie, which it did not need. And she has a pointless conflict subplot with her boyfriend that just goes absolutely nowhere. Not to mention Judy Greer's character just being on standby the whole film, not really doing anything at all. Her character seemed to do a total 180 as well. She just had a change of heart by the end. I'll go into that more in spoilers, but character motivations were just strange in the third act. Even though the acting was solid, the characters were so bloody bland. Don't get me started on peanut butter penis. If you know, you know. How they could have such a comical character like that in a Halloween movie and think it's a good idea, I have no clue. Then we get Mr. Cowboy Agent with a hat that literally does fuck all. Like, think back to the film. What was the point in that character? Just think about it. This film was just full of pointless people. It's baffling. I'll go more into that in spoiler talk too, so stick around. Now, one thing I did enjoy about this Halloween was the brutality and that it didn't pull many punches when it came to showing us Michael's kills. The brutality it brung across brilliantly with some great practical effects any horror fan will be happy to see back on the big screen. Now, I do think some people will see this as a negative and see this gore as something that takes away from the charm of Halloween. I can see that myself, but I do feel it is needed for a successful horror in this day and age. In the original Halloween, Myers chokes out a victim, pins one to the wall with one stab and chokes the other out with a phone cable. There is an eerie simplicity and efficiency to his killing. The goriest kill we get is his sister at the beginning of the film, which we partially see through his mask, where in contrast here we get a lot of gore and a Myers who seems to toy with his victims rather than dispatch them quietly and with little creativity. I'll go into some of that in the spoiler section about the kills and the gore as well. There were a couple I thought were a little too much, but that's for later. In this day and age though, with everyone being so desensitised, I think upping the violence was the right choice, but it would have been great if that violence was accompanied by atmosphere and unforgiving tension. For me, the atmosphere and tension of the original just wasn't recreated at all. It just didn't have that charm about it, and I think some of that is down to the film's pacing. It didn't take its time and make us go through a gruelling wait for the horror. It just threw it in our face from the outset. I think if they took their time a little more, gave us more time with the characters they were introducing to get to know them before some of them get dispatched by Myers, it would have left a proper mark on us, but some characters were so paper thin, you just do not care at all when or how they go. It falls into what a lot of slashers fall into, just having characters for no other reason than to up the body count. Even if the characters weren't the best, they could have made some of the deaths more meaningful, but some really just happened for the sake of it happening. To touch on a few other things, lighting, audio, sound design, set design, all solid. They get a pass. But this is where I'm going to leave it for my non-spoiler review. I'm done talking about it. I want to get a little bit into spoilers now. So with all that said and done, I'm going to give Halloween 2018 a 2.5 out of 5 rating. It was just very bog standard average at best for me. But as always, if you enjoyed it or hated it more than me, let me know in the comments section below. So the non-spoiler portion of the video is done now, we are moving on to the spoiler discussion. Where I'll be talking about things I liked and disliked, it will just contain things that happened in the film, so if you haven't seen it yet, then you might want to click off, but if you have or don't care, let's get into it. So off the bat, I loved the kid who was being looked after by Andy Matichek's high school friends. He was comedy gold. I felt his comedy felt right, it didn't feel out of place or forced at all like other scenes that literally felt like shit improv. The way he was like, I know you're talking about weed to Dave on the phone, and when Michael turns up he just fucking gaps it. It was class, then the classic, 
shut up Dave and Dave if you go up there you're gonna fucking die he was just one of the highlights of the film for me and I cared more about him than almost everyone else I felt like he acted the way you would act in that situation and his comedy was on point it's a real damn shame not everyone else could have been like this kid another thing that I did love was the long tracking shot of Michael I mentioned this in non-spoilers but seeing him in suburbia that scene put a big smile on my face it reminded me a lot of the start of Halloween 2 in 1981 where Michael bumps into trick-or-treaters and I loved how in the 2018 version they used that same sound sample from the original that was a damn nice touch then the whole sequence that followed was awesome it just didn't carry much weight because he was killing random people we didn't know but still it was awesome that stab at the end in front of the window that was that was pretty brutal <sighs> sorry just taking a drink of beer before this part before we start getting into this stuff <sighs> okay now something i have to get on to is the comedy I didn't like Peanut Butter Penis Dad. Like, what the hell was that all about? I felt like I was watching Modern Family in that scene. Honestly, this guy was goofier than fucking Phil Dumphy. I honestly wish they just cast Ty Burrow and told him to act the same way he does in Modern Family. Because then I would have cared more. I see where they were going with the goofy cool parent and all, but I just felt it was so forced and out of place. Then the third act when he dies... He dies by himself, no one sees it. Not his daughter or his wife, there is just no impact. I think Laurie looks out the window and sees him lying there dead, then his wife asks where he is and doesn't get an answer, then just forgets about him. (laughs) I mean, they had his daughter running through the woods at the time that he was running into Michael, so couldn't she have at least seen his death, giving us some emotional impact? No? Oh, and let's actually talk about her running through the woods. She stumbles into Laurie's shooting gallery of mannequins. And as she looks around at them, they all start whispering at her and she's hearing voices. What the hell was the point in that scene? There was no point whatsoever. This film was just full of shit that had no point to it at all. Was she having a schizophrenic episode or something of the sort? Did she take drugs at the dance and is now tripping? Or was it something supernatural? What the fuck was it and what was the point? Cut that all out, have her run out of the woods, see her dad in Michael's hands, have her plead with him, then have Michael kill him and we see her reaction. Not have her run through the woods for fucking 20 minutes talking to fucking mannequins. Fuck me, man. Who fucking wrote that? And while we're on Matt Chet's character, how pointless was the cheating boyfriend angle? What was that actually for as well? Oh, I know. To throw her phone in chip dip so she can't use it while she's being chased. And just for another pointless kill. And it isn't even her dickhead cheating boyfriend that gets it. It's his super bad looking ass friend who gets hung up on a fence, which is quite cool, but would have been better if it was the cheating boyfriend, like we've been led to hate him, so why just forget about him? Now, let's get on to the one thing that took me out of the movie. It was at this point I gave up and knew I wasn't going to enjoy the rest of this film and couldn't because every shred of immersion was evaporated after this. The bloody doctor. Michael's doctor, the new Loomis. No, sorry, you are not the new Loomis. You're not replacing Donald Pleasance. No one can. You are a tit. First of all, his voice went through me. And when he got shot on the bus, it was fucking hilarious. But the big twist was fucking dreadful. So Michael's doctor, Laurie's granddaughter and the sheriff, played by Will Patton, are all in the sheriff's jeep. They see Michael and the sheriff runs him over. You know, that's what you do when you see Michael, man, is you run him over because you're trying to kill him. He's a psycho. Good on you, Will. The doctor starts freaking out, saying, you almost killed him. And all this, he wants to take him alive while Patton's character's having none of it. So they get out of the car and the doctor runs over to Michael's body having a suit. Then the sheriff starts coming over to see if he's dead. And the doctor whips out a pen that's got a fucking combat knife attachment, turns round, stabs the sheriff about 40 times for the sole reason that he wanted to know what it felt like to commit murder. All while Matichek's character is in the backseat locked in, going off. 
Sorry, I paid the price of admission to see Michael Myers go on a murder spree, not some bloody psychiatrist with a dodgy accent. No joke, it was worse than mine. So anyway, the doctor gets Michael into the back seat with Alison. She doesn't even try to make a break for it, at least I don't think, I can't really remember, I might have still been laughing while that happened, because just before, the doctor dips out of frame for a second, and then pops up onto the jeep bonnet wearing Michael's mask. <laughs> and it was honestly the hardest I've laughed at a film in a long, long time. Everyone I was with, including myself, all just burst into laughter. It was just, my sides were sore. My sides were hurting. Then I looked around the theatre and just seen people in genuine shock at what was on screen. This tiny wee guy with this mask on him, it just, it looked so fucking dumb. It was a shit jump scare. And it was funny when it wasn't trying to be funny. Like he looked like a five year old kid at fucking Halloween that was wearing that adult's mask. It was ridiculous. So anyway, once we recovered from that, Michael is in the back with Alison, knocked out from being ran over, and the doctor starts driving them to Laurie's house to have their big face off or whatever. It's basically the same plot as Godzilla 2014 when you think about it. Where's Ken Watanabe? Let them fight. Same as fucking bloody Jurassic World too, with the T-Rex getting to face Indominus, but anyway, back on track. They pull up just down from the cops that are sitting watch out front of Laurie's house and here's what the cops are talking about. So they have a solid two minute conversation about what each of them have for dinner. One has the sandwich, one has the chocolate and it's meant to be funny. I thought okay, little giggles from some people in the crowd, but why? Why is this happening? Anyway, it'll be over soon, right? Wrong. The scene keeps going and I had to turn to everyone in disbelief and they were too. Here we are watching the sequel to fucking Halloween and we are witnessing two dumb cops talk about their fucking packed dinners for about five minutes. It was just, there's no words to describe it, it was just dreadful. Like funny and it's a so funny it's bad way, it's a so bad but funny way, it was just... I can't get over it. It's like something I'd expect to see in Rush Hour, except you wouldn't see it in Rush Hour because Rush Hour's actually fucking good. I just... I don't know. It's like they've got people who never done stand-up in their life and put them on whose line is it anyway and told them to talk about a sandwich for five minutes. That's what it was fucking like. But anyway, Michael wakes up and breaks out of the back seat without killing Allison for some reason, drags the doctor out of the car and proceeds to crush his head like a fucking tomato. It was brilliant to see the guy who took me out of the film get taken out this way. It gave me a quick little glimpse of joy, but later that joy was ripped away, but for the moment, I enjoyed it. There was a similar head stomp in Rob Zombie's second Halloween, so I wonder if it was a shot at him saying, look, we can do it better. The guy in Rob Zombie's face got dented, but here the doctor's face looks like a fat chef has slipped on a calzone, or if someone has thrown a shitty lasagna at the bin. It was good to see it done with practical effects and the practical gore was one of the film's strong points as I said and it was just nice to see this prick get his head stomped. Sadly, the film just had all these strands that just didn't connect together. You've got history between Laurie and her daughter, something there between Laurie and her granddaughter, then you have peanut butter penis just doing nothing, Alison's shitty boyfriend and his creepy teen movie friend best bud the podcasters who literally are just there to give Michael his mask back. That's everyone. To my next point, how the fuck were the podcasters allowed Michael Myers' mask? The guy says he has a friend in the DA's office, but I'm pretty sure not even a mate in the DA's office with a job like that could snatch you something from evidence lockup. Then again, I can't really say because I don't know anyone that works in the DA's office. If you do, let me know in the comments. So yeah, the podcaster's purpose was to wind Michael Myers up, feed us exposition for like most of the first act, and give Michael his mask. And they do it. And then he kills them. Move on. Next. It's all just very meh. Now let's move on to the final showdown in Laurie's house. I hated how she put the spotlights on and it made it look like daylight outside. Just made the whole final showdown less scary. Although, I doubt it wouldn't have changed much in the dark. They reshot the third act of The Predator to be in the dark and the third act was still shit. 
Lori was playing hide and seek with Michael while her daughter and granddaughter are under the kitchen floor in a bunker of sorts with loads of guns by the way that neither of them pick up. So Laurie is closing off each room with these gates that come down in the doorways, like you know when shops close 10 minutes early? Kinda like that. And it reminded me of when Dallas is in the air vents and alien, that type of thing. I was like, okay, this might lead to some tension, let's get it, but no, it doesn't. Do you want to know what it leads to? It leads to old mate peanut butter penis flopping out of a wardrobe after being stuffed in there by Michael. God knows when he had time to do that, by the way. And then Michael appearing behind Laurie, throwing her from the window, her landing outside. Then Michael looks over and she's gone. A complete rehash of the finale in the original. And it just felt super fucking corny to me. Like, Anyone else? Just me? I don't know. It was corny, man. Also, can I add, Laurie's fortress of a home has about six locks and a deadlock on her front door. It would take a bulldozer to get through that thing, right? No, you're wrong. Because she kept a door with glass on it. Glass. Glass Michael easily smashes his hand through and unlocks all the locks in about two minutes. She prepared well over these 40 years, that's for sure. But let me get back to the final showdown. Laurie runs and hides in the bunker along with her daughter and granddaughter while Michael stomps about above. She wants to keep them safe and hidden by Michael. So what does she do? She shoots through the fucking floor in an attempt to kill him, but all it does is alert him to where they are. Good one, Laurie. Michael ends up going in after them, they get by him, and it turns out that the bunker is not a safe room. It's a, what is it Judy Greer? It's a trap. Yeah, right after one of the film's corniest lines, bars slide over the entrance to the bunker locking Michael in, and a gas pipe contraption sets the room into flames, burning Michael alive as he stands and stares. Judy Greer's character that loathed her mother for her shitty paranoia filled childhood suddenly looked to be enjoying herself at the end. It was very strange. Then if you are brave enough to sit through the credits you hear Michael's breathing after them. So yes, we are getting sequels. I've done a video a few weeks back actually about Jason Blum talking about a new trilogy if you're interested but yes, Halloween 2018 did do well at the box office. It smashed it actually. So we can expect more, but I pray to God that they're slightly better than this one. Carpenter said that this Halloween would be the final chapter, but we knew it probably wouldn't. We knew the third act was changed after reshoots after a secretive test screening consensus was that the movie was okay but the ending wasn't great, so God knows how bad that ending was. I personally think it would have been better to make this the final chapter for real and have Laurie and Michael kill each other. I think that would have been far more fitting, but hey, that's just me. If you stayed this long, thank you very much for listening to me rambling and ranting, and if you did enjoy, hit like and remember to subscribe to join the club. As always, thank you very much for watching, I will see you in the next one, and good night.